Hello everyone, welcome to session four of LTech 782 Design-Based Research in Education. So we left off conducting our initial orientations where we focused on understanding the problem, its potential causes, and stakeholder needs and desires. We acknowledge that these steps were just the beginning of forming a complete and coherent design argument. And today I'm happy to report that Critical Reflection 3 seem to get everyone thinking about a complex educational problem that they'd like to propose tackling via DBR. So now that we're entering session four, what we're going to do is continue our deep dive into the analysis and exploration phase of the DBR process. And just so you have the full picture of the second half of the semester, you can see here that we'll spend session four completing analysis and exploration. Session five will be about design and construction, and the class will end with session six, where we'll delve into evaluation and reflection. Now, as we move through these phases, please keep in mind our dual focus on theory and practice. Theoretically, we want to be thinking about how we can extract understanding and provide knowledge that is useful to others. Practically, we want to focus on creating educational interventions that will actually be used and solve real authentic problems. With all of this in mind, I want to highlight the idea that the work that we'll be doing over the next three weeks is designed to feed right into your DBR proposals. That's not an accident. Each week, as you're working, try to get your ideas down in writing and think about what sections of the proposal requirements can be filled with whatever it is you're working on. If you strive to write two or so pages a week, you'll already have a solid draft of your proposal when we get to the end of session six. Okay, so now I want to talk about the inputs and outputs of the analysis and exploration phase. Let's start by walking through the inputs. The first input you've already done, and that's the initial orientation. And as you know, in this step, we thought about the problem, the context, and the stakeholders. The next input is the literature review, which I know some of you have already started. The literature review is designed to accomplish three things to develop a broader understanding of the problem, to provide ideas which can help shape data collection, and to assist in identifying frameworks for data analysis. When approaching the literature review, it's useful to assume that the problem that you've identified has already been experienced by another researcher. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Lean on that previous work in ways that can and will strengthen your own design-based research. The third input is the field-based investigation. Now you'll see that McKenney and Rees place a lot of emphasis on this stage. In fact, they present this as a mini-study, a microcycle in and of itself. Now, in our situation with the pandemic and a short summer semester, it's not realistic for us to do this, so we'll largely be skipping over it. But it is important to recognize the value of field-based investigations and how they can immerse you in the problem context and help you develop ideas about why things are happening the way they are. Ideally, the field-based investigation helps you further define the problem, analyze the context, and understand the needs of stakeholders. The fourth input is exploration. This process involves finding new ways to look at your problem and possible solutions, as well as seeking out any invented wheels others have developed. I like to think of this as an environmental scan, one that looks for work other people are doing in related areas. In short, what do their solutions look like and what can we learn from them? Exploration, again, helps us to refine our problem, understand how similar problems have been tackled. It can motivate us and inspire us and also identify like-minded designers and researchers. Okay, now let's talk about the four outputs of the analysis and exploration phase. Keep in mind that although there are four inputs and four outputs, there isn't a one-to-one -one correspondence here. All of the inputs should shape and influence all four of the outputs. Okay, so what's the first output? The first output is the problem statement. A problem statement describes the discrepancy between the existing and desired situations and offers explanations for why that discrepancy exists. 
Ideally, your problem statement will be descriptive, explanatory, and accurate. Let's take a look at an example. Here's one example from McKenny and Reeves. They provide three different examples on pages 114 and 115. I've chosen the one on technology use as I thought it might be the most relevant to many of you. As shown here, the problem statement begins with a fairly general statement. Teacher use of technology frequently constitutes mere replacement of existing, less complicated and expensive materials, and sometimes even a decrease in the quality of learning interactions. This general statement is followed up by a more specific statement. I'll go ahead and read it. Only one of every eight middle school teachers in this district uses the tablet computers provided to them and their students in ways that are transformative with respect to how instruction is planned, implemented, and evaluated. So you can see here the focus of the problem statement becomes much more specific. They're talking about one out of every eight in this district. The problem statement then goes on to list explanations for the phenomenon under investigation. For example, it is well documented that teachers struggle to align technology use in general and tablet use in particular with other dimensions of their lesson planning. And of course, there are several other explanations. I won't read them all here. But the takeaway is your problem definition should be succinct and easy to comprehend for just about anyone. The second output of analysis and exploration is a long range goal. This goal should specify the overall aim of of the project. The goal or aim should be smart, specific, measurable, action-oriented, reasonable, and timely. Let's take a look at a long-range goal. In order to write a long-term goal, McKenney and Reeves suggest using the time, ability, behavior standard heuristic. Those of you who have studied instructional design are probably familiar with this approach. And here's an example of a long-term goal. After participating in this class for 10 weeks, the student will be able to identify and apply appropriate means for designing educational materials in a timely fashion, whether working independently or in a team. Importantly, it is recommended that your project have a single ultimate goal. Now, you may develop sub-goals along the way, but having a single long-term goal will help you prioritize aspects of your your intervention and your research and sharpen the focus of the project overall. The third output are partial design requirements. These refer to the criteria that will frame the design. In other words, factors that will determine implementation. These factors often include freedoms, opportunities, and constraints. Now, in the next phase of DBR, design and construction, we'll focus on design and design requirements in much more detail. But for now, take a look at these useful questions that can help you identify possible freedoms and constraints. I won't read them all, but let's take a look at the first one. What strengths and opportunities are present in the target setting which can be put to productive use? Obviously, that's an example of a freedom or an opportunity. The point is, answering these questions will help you identify partial design requirements for your intervention. The fourth and final output of the analysis and exploration phase is some initial design guidelines. These guidelines articulate core ideas that underpin the initial design. They're sometimes referred to as design hypotheses or design conjectures. These guidelines should be based on your refined understanding of the problem, context, and stakeholders. Now, McKenney and Reeves give us an example of an initial design guideline they used when writing their book. And that guideline went something like this. For people to be able to engage in educational design research in a meaningful way, they have to understand not just what it is and how to do it, but also why. So in their minds, understanding why people engage in design-based research was an initial design guideline for the design of their intervention which, of course, was this book. Ultimately, we're going to put all of this together. We'll take the outputs and begin to flesh out our overall design argument, which will take the following structure. So as you're working, I want to encourage you to begin to plug in these variables to complete your design argument. And this is the direction that we're going to be moving in week by week. 
Now, before we end, I just want to remind you to use your Critical Friends meetings and leverage office hours for guidance through this process. Okay, everyone, have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.